Hi everybody, welcome to the poetry vlog, as is the habit for season three, which is the season you're in actually. Um, we are going to do the introduction telling you what to expect and what to comment with, and then you can tune in for the longer episode. First of all, this episode was filmed with equipment provided by the Mellon Foundation, so I will from now on when using it be required to and I'm happy to give them a shout out because that's pretty rad actually. I love not doing this on my webcam on my computer. Second of all, what we cover today is something that's actually near and dear to my dissertation research heart in addition to writing heart, which is um, basically border violence. Mm. And we cover Benjamin's own writing from Platypus Press with a broadside. It's awesome. It's gorgeous. It's hybrid genre actually in a way that really moves me because I'm a very rhythm focused person. Mm. So you'll learn a little bit about rhythm. We'll talk about Bologna's work mm. and how what's seen as giant fiction is also maybe cross genre and also cross border mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. and it kind of raises awareness about violence by the end of this episode you should have action links so vetted resources where you can donate your time and energy um, or resources beyond that if that's what you have as well as some additional thoughts about what it means to have a white savior complex right so that's a lot of stuff in 20 minutes to summarize border crossing violence but mm -hmm. also different ways we can not undo because it's impossible to undo but put some salve in the world right mm -hmm. and try to prevent that violence from continuing some awesome work from benjamin and what he's doing out in the world um and the call for comments is contribute to the body of knowledge so be like hey here's some other information about border crossing violence here's some more resources people can link into or be the not knower and just ask what you're not sure about or what you're unclear about and i'll always engage with you in the content in the comments <laughs> all right anything i forgot i think that's good yeah <laughs> Awesome. All right, everybody, enjoy the episode. I promise I don't giggle this much throughout it. I kept a poker face and I will- I don't think I giggle at all. Yeah, that was good. I, I, I would giggle. So I'll talk to you all in the comments. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> Today we have special guest Benjamin Ficklin. Benjamin, will you introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Benjamin Ficklin. Um, I'm from Portland here. I'm a writer. I've done journalism, fiction, poetry, hybrids. I don't know if categories are real and I like to try to undermine them. And then I'm a photographer, among other things. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, where can people find you online? Uh, my website is uh, benmf, B E N M F dot com. Um, and then I have a Twitter um, at arts BMF, arts BMF. Perfect. Yeah. Um, will you just launch right in by reading some of your own work today? Yeah, please. Thank you. The title is There Will Only Be One Funeral. If you head south along a foothill of the Siskiyou mountain range, you might see a maple leaf detach and spiral downward, leaving the tree it once was to become rigid, singular, delicate, lying on a rock amidst tall brown grass, eventually succumbing to time and becoming dust, detritus, much more. You might notice it, though you just as easily might see a hunk of madrone bark peel backward to reveal amber skin smoother than human epidermis. You might hear a scream. You might hear the high idle of a pickup truck as you trot between the manzanitas and Oregon grape, turning from this outcropping into a valley furry with moss. Perhaps the creek runs off the mountain snowfall on a rainy day, but if you heard the scream, it's a sunny autumn afternoon and the creek is not yet a creek, it's a series of pools blooming clouds of mosquitoes. In the gully rises a path, muddy and wide enough for an automobile, steep enough that the humans trundling up the slope with plastic tubs in their hands have to lean forward and plant each step carefully. Depending on your ears, you might hear the pudgy blonde guy in black overalls and cowboy boots wheeze the phrase, oh fuck, around his lit cigarette. He notices, after leaping out his vehicle, 
where his emergency break is not. You might know his name is Teddy Kilpatrick, but that everyone calls him Boss or Little Ted. Little Ted, because further up the hill from him and his slipping truck is Big Ted. Theodore Kalani sitting in his XXL camping chair between the cousins Marta and Margarita, who might be speaking Italian while Big Ted shucks nugs off three foot long stems into one of the bins. The cousins might be shucking too, or maybe they're rolling cigarettes while Reggie Urbanksa or Gabriel Luna Colombo heft the just harvested weed from the plants to the shuckers. Or maybe it's early summer when you're sniffing along a trail. You might smell the burnt odor of the ponderosas or the smoke from a nearby forest fire. You might see those seven rows of plants thick with colas growing longer in the sun, but the scream occurs in the fall. And your olfaction might be whelmed by the marijuana and the madrone berries steaming half digested in piles of bear shit. You might look down from whatever tree you're perched on to see the plants stripped of flowers, green skeletons, if you're one of the 38 dweedlers, you might gasp as you look up at the shrieking LSD Leanne. She stands above the slipping truck with the view of the muddy hill. Or maybe you're a juvenile turkey on a paved road, one turkey from a flock of 19, and you might be pecking the freshly crunched carcass of your mother when the scream turns all your heads in fear. But just as easily, you might be a gray fox eating a Jerusalem cricket. Or you might be that cricket feeling your abdomen ripped from your thorax. You might be an old rabbit with a broken leg trying to run from a coyote. You might be, at the moment Ed Connor turns to see who's screaming, a three-day-old road-killed skunk or an ant. Yes, maybe you're an ant defending your home from a black bear. Or you might be a fern crushed by a tire. Or... 11 seconds after the scream, you might be a human with a muddy face shattered, a spine snapped. You might be the tick buried in Ed Connor's hairy back as he inhales his chew upon seeing his brother sitting in the mud at the base of the hill. Or you might be Carissa Jalin sitting on the couch in your trailer, pulling a hit from a bong, and next to you might be little Teddy, and he doesn't know you're pregnant, and you won't tell him because you're ashamed of him for not joining the other dweedlers in the morning, the ramifications of his fuck-up. If the maple leaves are dropping from the life they once were, then you might be James Connor, struggling to pull your prosthetic leg out of the hill's grime, your empty plastic bin beside you, your ascent paused. You might have a nice view of the foothills full of mist. You might think you've never seen leaves so large. That night, that might be your last thought before you hear LSD Leanne scream, turning back just in time to see the truck. You might be alive for now. Or you might fly over the frantic gully full of trapped fog to land on a madrone growing cockeyed on an outcropping farther south. You might be the snow-capped siskiyous. You might be the mud or the pink sun at twilight. Mm. Thank mm. you. Yes. Thank you for listening to that. Yeah. yeah, no, I loved it. I also love that you're a multi-genre writer, right? So you yeah. write fiction, poetry, nonfiction, you do photography, but you don't read like most fiction readers. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, so I actually sure. want to ask you two questions about your work. Please. So first, how does rhythm function for you when you're writing fiction and what's mm. your revision process look like? Mm. Because it's very clear when you read that you have a, a like strong attention mm -hmm. to the way the sentence is roll out mm -hmm. as much as you do towards what people associate with fiction, right? sure. which is like character development, plot mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. setting a scene, and so on. Um, and second of all, when you're reading, what functions in you to kind of create that rhythm as a performance mm -hmm. element? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, like, yeah. What do you find you get from working across the genres when it comes to rhythm? Because gotcha. I find that rhythm's one of the most difficult things to teach mm -hmm. and to really put your finger on mm -hmm. with writing. Mm -hmm. And it's clear you have a rhythm. Thank you. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, I guess first off is like I don't think categories are real. Or at least like when I sit down and I'm there, I'm not thinking like, I'm going to write this piece of prose, and that's absolutely a piece of prose. It's more for me that there is like a story or an emotion 
or a series of ideas or even just a character or a place that needs to get presented in a certain light, in a certain way. And yeah. so in sitting down to write, there will only be one funeral, I knew that I wanted a cadence to it. I knew that it was, I wanted it to feel like a cascade uh, in some ways. And so with that, um, I actually like will just holler at the initial process, the writing of draft one, sitting and writing it on a typewriter is actually huge for me yeah. in creating a cadence. Um, operating on a computer, it's so easy to just go back and start working on what you had done three lines prior. Yeah. Or to go, oh, switch a word out in the first line, even though you're halfway through a piece at this point. Yeah. Whereas if I sit down, and that's what I did with this piece, it's easier with flash fiction than anything else, but to sit down and go, okay, I'm not going to stop typing until this piece is done. Right? I'm yeah. going to get draft one done as yeah. I sit here. And the rhythm of the keys, the pace of how fast I can move, um, dictates my rhythm yeah and then I read out loud like I my revision process to speak yeah. to that is like I am reading out loud and I'm reading out loud and there are edits that I'll do if I'm like got my printed piece of paper that I'm marking up with a red pen right there'll be an edit where I'll just write like there needs to be a beat here yeah yeah there needs to be a moment where Garcia Marquez has this great line where he has like it's he has his inhale sentences so he's notorious, right, for having these massive run-on yeah. sentences that in some instances last an entire book, but in other instances will last pages. Yeah. And then he'll have these inhale sentences where you, the reader, go, whoa, that was a lot that I just read, yeah. and that sentence that's very little clear, like, and the yellow flowers were blooming that day, or whatever, it's like, oh, that's this little inhale sentence that yeah. feels very concrete. Yeah. So I, like, I'm thinking about that all the time in structuring a piece like this. Yeah. When am I grabbing the reader and going, we're moving at a million miles per hour right now. Very slow down now. And when do I give them a glass of water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, the, and I love what you're saying about categories. I think to help folks out a bit, because I think sometimes people hear, kind of like when people say, I don't believe in gender. Yeah. Right? Um, it's not that they're not real in mm -hmm. the sense of they're not experienced mm -hmm. as that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but they're not real in the sense that they're not cemented or they're mm -hmm. not like sort of organic things that pre-exist that we automatically mm. fall into per se. Mm. So mm. for instance, like something I like to think about is it's not so much that like categories themselves aren't like real, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, as it's like, they're sort of an accumulation of experiences that fit or don't fit into what we consider different categories, yeah. right? Yeah. Or that there's far more and they're kind of nonstop proliferation mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. point where it becomes maybe meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. To speak to your point, like the categories exist. Yeah. Where people participate in them, like absolutely. But in terms of like publishing categories, it's like at some point I see that as just like yeah. constructions of the capitalist yeah. industry that is the publishing world. And they're being like, yeah. you have to label yourself one or the other, or we can't make sense of you. Yeah. And we exist in this cool moment right now where there are these hybrid books that are coming yeah. out. Citizen by Rankin is maybe the most overtly apparent where yeah. it just it feels like, wow, I've never read a book like this before. And then Citizen has gone on to have so much yeah. success, which I think yeah. is really exciting. It's like prose blocks, scene, mm. fiction, essay, photography. Film, yep, exactly. Yeah, when I was, so I just finished a manuscript last week. This um, piece that I just read is a part of it. Um, and then in hitting up my agent, and being like, this is what I'm working on. It's this crazy hybrid collection that yeah. has like lists and there's essays in it and some of my photography. And my agent was like, that sounds great, but like, how the hell are we gonna sell that? Yeah. yeah. Um, but then to say, like, if we are looking at it through the lens of the industry, which is sometimes not a useful lens, as we're talking about, is a necessary lens to look through sometimes, it's like, that shit is selling now in a way. Yeah. yeah. Citizen being the best example of like, yeah, yeah this shit is out there. Um, yeah. But then, yeah, like there's all like there's tons of authors across. I actually time and think space. we can also connect this very easily to what you want to talk about today. Yeah. Um, maybe this is my bias. My my fourth dissertation chapter is on like cross genre is also potentially cross border. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, it's a yeah, way yeah. that you can enact it. And I know you want to talk about that a little bit today. Yeah. So let's do the transition. Sure. Um, yeah. What did you bring to talk about today? And if you want, you can connect it to what we're talking about in terms of genre. Yeah, I think right? it's actually really relevant. Um. Yeah, so I'm in the middle of teaching this seminar um, through literary arts um, on a text by Roberto Bolaño, um, Chilean-born author who then lived in Mexico during his adolescence um, before going back to Chile and then ultimately um, being an uh, undocumented person in Spain throughout the whole rest of his life. And then his magnum opus, his big text that is just celebrated as uh, the 
largest treasure he left us is a novel called 2666. Um, but he is constantly exploring, breaking down, breaking down uh, literary uh, structures that we see as so absolute, where he will just like screw with the reader by throwing in second person for a while or talking like first person yeah. and then zoom out and you'll have 300 pages where it reads almost like a list. It reads almost like an academic essay. And then that's, um, yeah, the point in 2666 that is, the book is most notorious for that is the most challenging for readers um, is this part four, the part about the crimes, um, which is this devastating to read list of women that have disappeared or died um, on the Mexican side of the U.S. Um, Mexico border. And yeah. so he's there in that moment, writes this book, which is a very charming in intro intro that you would like first 200 pages don't get anywhere close to this yeah. and then suddenly it falls into this documentation of one of the like greatest horrors and one of the most politicized and violent spaces um in the world but yeah. definitely in this um close closest to the united states would you be willing to read a selection for us yeah kind of yeah from 266 yeah, yeah that would be great yeah there's um a section a couple sections that i picked out but i think there's one that's like very there's one that relates specifically yeah. to the deaths. This happened in 1993, January 1993. From then on, the killings of women began to be counted, but it's likely there had been other deaths before. The name of the first victim was Esperanza Gomez, and she was 13. Maybe for the sake of convenience, maybe because she was the first to be killed in 1993, she heads the list. Although surely there were other girls and women who died in 1992, other girls and women who didn't make it onto the list or who were never found, who were buried in unmarked graves in the desert, or whose ashes were scattered in the middle of the night, when not even the person scattering them knew where he was, what place he had come to. This, um, this section is the hardest thing um, that I've ever read and I think what part of what Bolaño is doing in it that ties into our conversation is that he ratchets up the tension of this book um, really slowly so you read these first pages that exist very engaged more narrative and then suddenly you're there thrown into this really um, this chronicle of violence in a lot of ways but I think what Bolaño is Doing. I mean, you know, there's a lot that we could unpack there um, about what Bologna is doing in this section, but I think part of it is giving life to people who have um, been disappeared largely without a lot of attention, especially in the United States. Yeah. Um, the, this text takes place in a fictitious city on the U.S.-Mexico border, but it's widely known um, that it's based off of Ciudad Juarez, and every death in this section is in place of somebody that actually has died. Somebody who went missing or someone whose body was found. So I think Bologna is there trying to give life and recognition to these people who, who have been largely yeah. largely unnoticed. I know that, um, oh, we didn't cover this yet in this episode. Now we're one knows you teach at Literary Arts. Yeah, And yeah. you were saying that you've been teaching this text. Um, yeah. What about this text is, like, what do you end up focusing on when you're mm. teaching it? Because something that I think can be really intimidating mm. about mm -hmm. Bonio's work is it's so vast, yeah. right? And it is also, like, in some ways experimental, and it's also, like, very much digging into these cultural and individualized traumas, mm -hmm. right? So what, how do you teach it, if that yeah. makes sense, right? Like, what's the access point for folks who mm -hmm. are wanting to do more reading up on these types of border violences, sure. right? But are very intimidated by, mm -hmm. like, unpacking something that's seen as, like, literary, like yeah. Bologna, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Bologna, I actually think if anybody were to start, pick, like, if someone were to pick Bologna up, he is actually so charming. Like, while his work, this is a thousand page book, right? How intimidating is that? But at the very beginning of it, you are put into this uh, this romantic situation that reads so engaging and so charming. You're like, oh, I want to find out what happens. Like, yeah, who falls yeah. in love with who here? And I think Bolaño has a great grasp of that in general. Like, his books are really engaging. Yeah. And then when it be, they become intense, he's handled it well enough or masterfully enough that you are already engaged in the book. Um, but as a teacher, you know, it's... 
there's a caveat in when I was advertising this seminar yeah. of the, the focus on border violence um, and violence against women. Patriarchy, the beginning of the book, takes place in Europe, and it's a lot of it is criticizing academic patriarchy. Yeah. Um, but to make it accessible, yeah, to just like to ground, to ground uh, our conversations in the text, give lots of space for people to talk. It's, leg I think, such a legitimate way of experiencing the book to talk about how you feel during it. You know, yeah. I think it's sometimes it's just like we'll witness an academic conversation or something where it's like so heady and it's so jargon filled and it's so technical. And I think to really process something as difficult as the part about the crimes, like to just be like, I read this and it made me feel awful, yeah. you know, which I think Bologna is trying to do. Like yeah. that whole section is drawing your attention to something, like I said, that is largely ignored and he wants you to feel yeah. awful. Yeah. He yeah. wants you to go, damn, I can't believe this is happening. How do you find your students grapple with the ethics of like being able to dip in and feel, but also having the privilege of stepping out, yeah. right? Because one like kind of underlying current, I mm -hmm. think, right now that people like don't want to talk about because mm -hmm. there's no answer to it perhaps, mm -hmm. but it's like on the one hand, and this is something I'm talking about a lot with guests, there's the need to call attention to these violences, mm -hmm. right? Because you have to like acknowledge their existence and mm -hmm. critique what formed them in order to create something else. Mm -hmm. But then there's the concern that there's this sort of like, presentation of violence and trauma mm -hmm. for mostly protected folks to feel like, oh, I've witnessed it, I felt mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to retreat back to yeah. my kind of like safer space or like feel like witnessing was enough or just trauma now is all I see mm -hmm. or just the violence and not also the very like complex lives. So mm -hmm. like how do you um, broach that? Because I'm guessing this comes up especially in folks who are reading hybrid and fiction and so yeah. on work, right? Yeah, I mean, like, and the, now we're just, like, moving toward activism um, a, a little bit, but it's, like, white savior complex is real. Um, the, the activist that is doing work to then go and retweet it or post a bunch of pictures of it, like, that phenomena is very real. Yeah. I mean, well, it was very well publicized in Standing Rock where people were showing up and the community that they were supposedly showing up for were like, yo, like, don't come. Yeah. Like, I, if you're gonna come, like, do this work. We don't need you to come and just like, do a bunch of fire dancing, you know? Like, you, like you, listening to the community um, is huge. Like, who yeah. you're gonna do work for, like, as a white person, like, I don't get to decide the way that my ability to help or engage in an idea is most yeah. useful. Like that is on us to, as white people, to listen and be like, is there a use for me here? Is there anything I can do to help? Am I wanted? Nope. Okay, sweet. I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then paying attention to, yes, you have to do this one specific thing and it is not sexy. It is cleaning out the bathrooms, but no one else will do that. And so if you really want to yeah. help, someone has to clean out the bathrooms. Yeah. Um, yeah if one wants to dismantle their own privilege, you know, it's like, don't use the privilege that, that allows you to be like, I want to do whatever the fuck I want to to feel yeah. good about myself, yeah. you know? Like, ask, like, how to apply that to help the people that you are supposedly trying to be there to work yeah. with and for. Ask and yeah. listen well, and if it's not the thing that, like, um, you want to do, then you weren't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, if someone <laughs> yeah. says, like, thanks for this intention, yeah. but you're really misguided, I'm not thinking you yeah, need to go yeah. home. Like, part of being a good ally is like, Okay, I want to shut the fuck up and admit that I like didn't yeah. know what I was talking about. Um, yeah, or or you know, ask is there a way I can show up or that you want me to, mm -hmm. right? Um, and be okay yeah. if the answer is no. Yeah. you know, like uh, it, like I the right as an example right now that I know of, it's like people very much are uh, I think coming from a good spot and wanting to help out Puerto Rico, but then there's this movement right now where people are Puerto Ricans are there being like, actually, we want to deal with the fallout ourselves and we're not looking for the gringo who wants to come here for three weeks yeah. and then do some work and then peace out again yeah. you know and it's like acknowledging that that's real and be like i'm not going to go take that space yeah um and to, so to wrap up actually this is perfect what are some links that you can give people yeah. ways that they can help yeah right because i think that border violence is getting increasing publicity mm -hmm. which has both pros and cons like we discussed mm -hmm. today but there were some very vetted resources you already put together yeah so yeah. where what are those and what would you recommend um the the organization that i really want to shout out to is the south texas human rights center 
Um, I've been lucky to have the opportunity to go down and do volunteer work um, with them. It exists in a similar capacity to the um, really notorious No More Deaths, um, No Mas Muertes, which are doing a really good thing in Arizona, but No Mas Muertes, um, No More Deaths are at a point where they don't need all the volunteers. They can't yeah. handle all the volunteers. Let's just turn on the resource. If they were to just let everybody that wanted to come help out, so there's an application process, No More Deaths is doing great stuff. Um, South Texas Human Rights Center has virtually no volunteers. When I was down there, when I left um, with a friend of mine, when she and I got out of there, they had no volunteers. Um, they need as much help as possible, and South Texas is um, statistically where the most people go missing or die right now, and I think it's like a wildly undercounted um, number. So just because of the logistics, though, it being in South Texas, it being around ranch land and not uh, public land, it's not a very appealing place to go volunteer, you know? And I think that's part of the reason that it's like, okay, like, if you want to be the best ally you possibly can, and if you really want to go do this work, like, everybody knows about some of these other border organizations, and you could go, like, work there, and, like, that's not an awful thing to do, but, like, here's one that is in the middle of the nowhere, and is very uncomfortable in a lot of ways, but they need the most help. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of the amount of people um, who are dying or disappearing yeah. in that part of the Frontera. Perfect. Thanks so much, Benjamin. Yeah, thanks so much um, uh, for having me. And quick shout out to a scholar I really like too, who yeah. does a lot of work on this, is Jade Power Sotomayor. Mm. She does a lot of work on um, dance as a type of like resistance at the border. Yeah. And she has some cool stuff out there on it, so I want to give a quick shout out there. I uh, know Valerie Louise Swelly just came out um, with a new book, I think Chronicle of Lost Children, um, that's about okay, the border. Cool. Just came out, it's like, I haven't read it yet. Yeah. But yeah. So we'll have all those links in the description below. We're going to do our quick wrap up. Um, is there anything that we didn't shout out that you want to give a shout out to? Oh, wow. Yeah, lots. Yeah, shout out to Stick and Poke Tattoos. Um, <laughs> shout out to like the old dirty spaces in Portland, Oregon that don't exist anymore. Yeah, definitely shout out to the South Texas Human Rights Center and um, shout out to my buddy Park Poom. I miss you, man. And Platypus Press. And Platypus Press. Yeah, shout out to and Platypus. And they're rad. I actually really love yeah. Platypus yeah, Press. Yeah, me too. Um, all right, perfect. Thanks, Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Everyone else, um, as always, leave your comments below. The call for comments today is if you have some type of knowledge about border crossing violence and resistance, that you drop that in the comments. If you have more questions about it, then you drop that in the comments. And then we'll try to respond there and be in dialogue that way. And as always, you can visit the po visit thepoetryblog.com. It's the hub for Twitter, Instagram, podcast edition. I'm still sending um, magnets and stickers to folks that sign up for the email newsletter because I like snail mail. So you just sign up for that. And that's it today. All right. Thanks, Benjamin. All right, bye, everybody.